great to see all of you and thank you for joining us on this wintry North Country afternoon. Uh, today we're very excited to hear what Dr. Diana White has to say regarding her research in treating Eurasian water milfoil. Uh, early last spring in our meeting with the Indian River Lake Association leaders, there was a strong consensus that EWM was one of the most prevalent concerns uh, regarding our invasive species threats to our lakes. So over the year, we took a deep dive to learn as much as we could uh, from and talk to as many experts as we could uh, about Eurasian water milfoil, and that brings us to where we are today. Uh, the single thing that we have learned is that there's no silver bullet to treating EWM. We're beginning our uh, year uh, looking at the, exploring the possibility of having our project rural students collect and brood native milfoil eating weevils in partnership with our lake associations. Uh, if this is successful, we look forward to working with lake associations and lake residents in assisting them in establishing their own weevil rearing programs um, as an inexperienced, inexpensive uh, treatment method for treating uh, Eurasian water milfoil. Uh, IRLC's new watershed coordinator, uh, Jacob Ball. Jacob, raise your hand so everybody sees you. Uh, he'll be standing up a Eurasian water milfoil strike force, uh, working with lake residents and pulling milfoil along shorelines and docks. Uh, one note, uh, please uh, mark your calendars for August 27th. That is our uh, new date for our water quality conference. Uh, we pushed the conference to late summer in hopes of of uh, being able to actually have the conference in person this year. Um, at the conference, we're excited to present on what we learned on the feasibility of weevil rearing, uh, the success of the strike force, and of course, other relevant topics regarding water quality in the lakes that we love. Uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Diana White. Uh, Diana hails from Newfoundland, Canada, uh, where she earned a joint BS in math and physics uh, she moved out west to Alberta. She earned her master's in P and PhD in mathematical biology at University of Alberta. And she then did her postdoc work at La Cassin Institute for Virology in Alberta, and then a second postdoc at the Institute of Mathematics in Aix Marseille in southern France. That sounds like a pretty good gig. Uh, in 2016, she joined Clarkson. At, uh, at, as an assistant professor of mathematics um, in the mathematics department. Uh, recently, she began interested in modeling ecological systems on, present, on problems related to invasive species spread and control. In 2017, Diana was awarded a three-year grant from New York State DEC to study invasive water milfoil, which is where, wh what she's doing and what she's here to talk about today. So welcome, Diana, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you guys for taking some time on Saturday. This is my toddler's nap time. So if you hear my toddler screaming in the background while my husband is getting her down for a nap, uh, just ignore her. All right, um, you guys can hear me well because I have microphone on, earphones on. Okay, perfect. Okay. So I'm just gonna, the host disabled participant screening. So I think Heidi, you, I need to do a screen share here. I think if you also make me a host, I can do a screen share. Wiley, can you add Diana as a co-host, please? Perfect, thank you. Okay, and just to make sure, um, I'm going to start the slideshow. Can I get a thumbs up if you guys can see my slides? Okay, and they're moving? Okay, good. All right, so um, you guys all know who I am now, um, mathematics department at Clarkson, um, and I'm primarily interested in applications for biological systems. And I recently became very interested in ecological systems, um, in particular aquatic invasive species. Um, and because they're so prevalent in the area, and I'll talk a little bit more about exactly how I became interested in that in a little bit. So the idea um, 
uh, for this project came up with, uh, I came up with Michael Twist, who is chair of the biology department at Clarkson University. Um, and together we decided to tackle a project on sustainable approaches for managing invasive Eurasian water milfoil. And this picture here is just some field work that myself, um, some students from Clarkson, as well as the Nord Lake Association, um, we did a massive pull of milfoil when there was a huge drawdown. So this is actually Norwood Lake um, in Norwood in upstate New York, uh, when the water levels were dropped 12 feet um, from this particular impoundment. So it looks a little bit um, crazy, but all of this is milfoil. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the results from this pull, but this is just a picture of the field that I wanted to show you before we began. So I think most people have an idea about um, what an invasive species is, but I'll just give you a few of the characteristics. Um, they grow and they reproduce very quickly. So invasive species correspond to both terrestrial, right, and plant species, as well as animals. Um, they outcompete native species. So oftentimes plants form monocultures, meaning that they push out other native plants and they are the only thing that will grow in a particular area. And so this damages the natural ecosystem. Um, for all of us, right, what we really care about, well, we also care about the ecosystem, but we do care about recreation and economic values. And we find in places where these things take hold, um, these things decline, recreation declines, it's difficult to fish, it's difficult to swim and so on and so forth. Um, one important thing about a nascent species, it's distinct from say a nuisance species, is that it is not native to the region. So it's something that's brought from somewhere else. And unfortunately, uh, the major driver of invasive species is us. And so for example, aquatic invasive species often come from people who get a pretty plant, say from over in Europe or Asia and bring it over and put it in an aquarium and then dump it out into their lake. Um, so a lot of the invasive species that you see here are, are, are human transported. So these are just some common invasive species that you see in the area. Um, the emerald ash borer, many of you know about, um, that's an invasive species which feeds off the leaves of ash trees. The giant hogweed, um, that's also very poisonous and, and dangerous. Purple loosestrife is very beautiful. That is an invasive species though here. And some of the aquatic invasive species, we have zebra mussels, water chestnuts, frog bit, and down in the left corner, you can see the Eurasian water milfoil. And I'll give you guys a few more close-up pictures of that um, as we go on. So I think that Wiley already talked a little bit about this, but um, within New York State, um, Eurasian water milfoil has recently become a big problem. And the Department of Environmental Conservation has this sort of threat ranking assessment score and they've ranked it as high as possible. So it's 100. So it's really one of the top species, um, problem species within this state as well as within many other states. Um, it's not only your Asian water milfoil that's an issue and I'll actually talk about a second variety as well. Variable leaf water milfoil is also um, an invasive variety of water milfoil. Eurasian water milfoil is invasive to the entire states. It was brought over from Eurasia and some other places. Whereas variable leaf water milfoil, um, it's invasive to uh, New York, but it's actually local to some of the Southern reaches in the states. So over the past maybe 10 or 15 years, we've actually seen a shift of variable leaf water milfoil moving up. And so a lot of the lakes in our region, um, in the uh, St. Lawrence region, uh, have more issues with variable leaf water milfoil than Eurasian water milfoil. And in the Adirondack region, Eurasian water milfoil is more of an issue. So they're both found. Uh, and the middle picture actually is just a picture that I took this summer of, uh, I, I took a picture off of a trail around Clarkson University. This is the Racket River over a bridge. And this is what it looks like top down. Um, it's kind of just a, looks like a clunky mat. So, the stuff I'm going to talk about today, um, control uh, strategies for Eurasian water milfoil as well as variable water milfoil can be used in any lake, but this is the particular lake um, that we are studying our problem in. It's the Norwood Lake. It's about a 10 minute drive north from Clarkson University. Um, and the reason why I became interested in, in invasive species, I said that I would 
talk a little bit about this is because when I moved here in 2016, um, can you guys see my mouse here? I actually moved right here, right on the tip of this little point. And the week after I moved here, I got a flyer from the Norwood Locus Lake Association who had put them in everybody's, everybody's mailboxes asking them to please come to our next meeting. We're gonna be talking about Eurasian water milfoil and variable water milfoil and, and um, what we can do to control these things. And so myself and my husband went there. We got really interested in modeling this stuff and the rest is history. So we've been working very closely with the Norwood Lake Association. Um, and they've helped us apply for this grant with the Department of Environmental Conservation. And so they help volunteer when we need things done like laying mats or hand pulling. Um, they've been great. They volunteered lots of hours with us. So it's excellent. It's a community effort. Um, so just to show you uh, locations where variable leaf water milfoil has been found throughout Norwood Lake, uh, there is a small patch of Eurasian water milfoil, but the real issue is variable leaf water milfoil in this lake um, are these X's. So the, or the X's and the O's. So the X's are just sparse regions. So maybe one or two plants. And these O's are where there's tons of milfoil. And this was taken in 2016. And we were hoping to do a survey in 2018 when we got the grant as well as 2019, 2020, so on and so forth. But with COVID, this summer and the summer before with the massive drawdown, there was no water in the lake, we couldn't do this type of survey. So hopefully in the next couple of years, we can do this again to see the extent to which the uh, water milk will is spread. But the real issue is this region, which the locals call the mud cap. It's all over this region. And then down here um, at the southern part of the lake, these are the two main um, problem areas. So the invasive characteristics of Eurasian water milfoil, it outcompetes native plants, grows very quickly. Um, and it also forms these dense mats. So as the plant grows up, okay, it, as it reaches the surface, it forms a dense canopy and it, so it can then grow out horizontally. Okay? It also forms monocultures. It pushes out almost all native plants. So if you see a bed of milfoil, it's usually only milfoil. So it can grow in nutrient rich sediment as well as sediment without few nutrients. So it's very versatile. So that's kind of one of the dangerous things. It, it doesn't really care what the sediment type is like, it can, it can grow. Um, its preferred habitat is shallow water, um, but it can actually grow. It has been shown to grow up to 33 feet if the water's clear enough. Norwood Lake is fairly turbid. So it typically only grows in the more shallow areas of that lake. So by turbid, I mean, it's kind of murky. Um, and it can also reproduce by fragmentation. So fragmentation is one of, I would say, the most invasive characteristics and one of the most unique characteristics about this plant. Um, and I want to talk just a little bit about that before I move on, um, because a lot of other plants um, don't reproduce by fragmentation. And so typically when you think of plant reproduction, you think of um, plants producing seeds, and those seeds producing new plants. So water milfoil does do that. It creates flowers at the end of its growing season and it lets off seeds and it grows that way. But it also grows through vegetative reproduction, asexual reproduction um, in one of two ways. So one way it produces these so-called tubers or stolons. So for those of you who know a little bit about aspen trees, right? They, the roots can grow under the ground and then new trees can come up. And it's exactly the same thing with water milfoil. Stalins grow underneath the lake bed and then they come up and they produce new plants. Fragmentation is kind of scary. Um, it's like cutting your hand off and your hand creating a new person. So what happens if somebody swims through or maybe a boats through a place that's heavily infested with milfoil, fragments disperse and all of those fragments are viable to create new plants. So they travel downstream, they settle, they root and they're able to grow. Okay, so this is one of the um, primary invasive qualities about this plant. There's so many ways that it can reproduce. So Norwood Lake um, is a little bit different from other lakes. So when you talk about controlling invasive uh, water milfoil in lakes, right, typically the um, control strategy that you might define is unique to that particular lake. And there's no water coming in or out 
right? In the sense of like, a, uh, well, sometimes there's rivers and things, but Norwood Lake is different because it's a dammed reservoir. So you have lakes upstream and you have lakes downstream. So there's always milfoil coming in and milfoil coming out. And so we've actually um, done some tests where we've put nets at both ends of the, of the river where both dams were and, and we collected fragments that are coming in and fragments that are going out. And, and you typically do see during the entire season fragments coming in and fragments going out. So, so this is an issue. It's not just the issue of Norwood Lake, but we need to make a partnership with those upstream and downstream so that this can be a real community effort, get everybody on board. Okay, so one more picture I wanted to show you. This was um, a study that Michael twisted about 10 years ago with some undergrads. Um, so this is a picture of Norwood Lake again, and those contours represent depth. So I think it's as deep as 20 feet in the deepest region of this particular um, lake. And the green portion is the portion that could potentially be infested with either Eurasian water milfoil or variable leaf water milfoil if we don't do anything. And that's because the area, right, which is green, has the right characteristics. It's the right sediment type, it's the right depth, it's the right temperature for an infestation to occur. Uh, as of right now, the infestation, bad infestations are only in these two circled areas. Okay, so management practices. And I'm sure some of you have heard about all of these and some good things and some bad things, but we should talk a little bit about them. Um, these practices are things that have been done and, and are practices that still are actually done in, in, different, in different regions. So mechanical harvesting involves taking a tractor into the water and it's, it's like a lawnmower, right? So it just kind of trawls the bottom and it clips everything, right? Native and native plants. And it just pulls it back into the back of the vehicle. Um, so it's a very efficient and fast way to get rid of water milfoil. Um, but can anybody guess why that's probably not a, a good thing to be doing? Oh, I even had it there. I gave away the answer. Right, one of the main issues is that it does cause fragmentation, right? So as you're clipping away these things, you're releasing pieces, right? And you're also not removing the stalins or the root systems. So probably you're just making the, the, the issue worse, right? Plants are gonna grow back worse next year, but you've also released fragments that are going to grow into new plants. So mechanical harvesting typically can make problems worse and probably should only be used in worst case scenarios where there's nothing else that you can do for a lake. Um, hand harvesting is a good option if you have sort of just a small patch of milk oil that you want to get um, rid of, right? So pro is it can actually be done in a controlled setting. People can set up nets, right? And catch the fragments as they're released as people pull. Um, and, and, and it can be effective, right? But a con is that it is labor intensive and it, you can't use it for a very large bed of milk oil. Um, and oh, I should make the point that the Norwood Lake Association did have a very small patch of Eurasian water milfoil within that mud cap region I showed you. And two years ago, they hired a diver. Again, it was very expensive and the patch wasn't even that big. Um, but the diver had practiced doing these sorts of things and he was able to successfully remove that very small patch of Eurasian water milfoil. Um, and we know that because we went back the year after and then this summer and we checked and there's no evidence of return of the Eurasian water milfoil. So they were, they were successful at at least getting rid of that small patch, but the rest of their lake has variable leaf water milfoil. Uh, two more types of management practices, chemical treatments. I just say cons, no, no, no. Short time acting right in a reservoir, it's just gonna flow out. Um, it can affect both native and non-native plants, right? It's like chemotherapy, it affects normal, healthy cells. Uh, in cancerous cells, and it's costly. It's really expensive. And herbicides can be effective, but again, it, it, it can actually only be short-time acting as well, and it is very costly. And the idea is, you know, to develop sustainable strategies because, um, you know, we only, like communities only have a sufficient amount of money, and they only have a sufficient amount of resources and, and manpower. And then finally, benthic barriers. So pros, it can be effective at stopping growth. So benthic barriers, simply just a mat that you would lay down on the bottom of the lake. Um, 
The cons is that, right, it affects native and non-native species and you have to be careful, right, because you don't wanna maybe cover a, a spawning bed of fish or something like that. But if you are careful and you only cover a bed of milk oil, it can be effective in the same way hand pulling is effective at getting rid of a, a small amount of milk oil. Okay? So it's like a localized treatment. Okay. So the overall uh, sort of uh, message that I got when doing a lot of reading is that it seems like these practices are not sustainable alone. Nobody's really figured out a good way to get rid of milfoil um, that's both, co both cost efficient um, as well as labor, not labor intensive. Right? So the idea is maybe some combination of this can be used um, or even perhaps some other strategies. And I will get to weevils, okay? So biocontrol, yes, is, is an interesting idea and it's definitely something that I wanna talk about. We've done some modeling with weevils. And if there are questions, Heidi, that you think could be answered at the moment of like, uh, like of a certain slide or I, I don't mind answering them if there's like a relevant question. Okay, okay. so for the Norwood Lake, we had some project goals. Um, and the first project goal was to understand how the water milfoil is growing and then how it's spreading throughout the lake, okay? So before you actually want to go in and um, manipulate things, right? Try to alter an ecosystem, you probably should understand the natural ecosystem itself. You don't wanna try B before you try A, right? Or before you know anything about A, okay? Um, and then of course we wanted to look at different control mechanisms using mathematical models, predictive models. So this includes the benthic mats. So these are the only things we've looked at so far. Hand pulling, biocontrol, which is really exciting. The weevils, we'll talk about those. Um, and a drawdown. And initially we weren't thinking about drawdowns, but um, as I'll talk about in a few minutes, we ended up having a massive drawdown in Norwood Lake. And so we said, oh, well, we might as well study this. Um, so a drawdown is, is what happens, for example, on a dammed reservoir um, when maybe a dam needs to be repaired. So the water needs to be lowered. And so the water is lowered, which, um, which makes part of the land, right, that's shallow, exposed to air, right? So then if it's exposed long enough, the plants will die back. But of course, native plants die back as well. And so there's always this, you know, cost benefit analysis that has to be done when you do any of these things. So I just want to talk briefly about um, modeling the growth and spread before I talk about the control mechanisms. And I'm not going to get too mathy. Don't be scared of this equation. I just put this equation here because I know that there's a couple of math people here who probably wanted to see the equation. Um, and so the idea, the first thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to understand growth over time. So if we have a plant, how much biomass do we have? Um, how much biomass do we have every single day, right? So the plant is growing day by day by day by day. So we want to understand its growth rate, okay? And then afterwards, we want to understand the spreading. So lucky for us, uh, there have been some models that have been developed that look at modeling um, growth over time. So we didn't have to do a lot of work in the overall construction of our model. Um, we just had to so-called parameterize it. So there are certain model inputs such as temperature, nutrients, turbidity, right? These are inputs into the model which dictate how the plant grows. And those are specific to Norwood Lake. So if we put those into our model, then we can output a prediction of what we think, how much the plant will grow over a particular season. Just gonna move the box over here. So yeah, so these are our inputs. We plop them into our black box computer and you end up getting nice smooth curves. Um, and that's a simulation. That's a simulated result. That's a model result. But then what we wanna do, uh, which we haven't gotten to do, uh, unfortunately, so I'm showing you some field data from another study, is to, but we built them, built these quadrats, which are basically cubes, they're like scaffolds, and you dump them in the lake in a bed of milfoil, and then you pull all the milfoil from that quadrat, you dry it, you weigh it, and then you timestamp it. And then two weeks later, you do the same thing. You drop the quadrat, pull the milfoil, dry it, you calculate its weight, 
and then you timestamp it. And so that's what these square boxes are. See, these square boxes are those dry weight measurements over the season. And so the idea of modeling is to try to come up with a predictive model that fits those data points so that you can predict how the milfoil is growing over a season without having eventually to do all this labor of you know, dropping those quadrats and actually you know, getting these measurements. Okay. And this is just to show you some of the inputs that we've already collected. So we've done a lot of the modeling but we have to get the experimental data to verify it. So we have things like temperature recording. So these are all specific for Norwood Lake. We have things like total phosphorus measurements as well as chlorophyll. Um, and we also looked at turbidity as well. So we have turbidity calculations. We have all the inputs. Right? We just need the data to compare our models. So that will be really fun, right? So, so we'll be able to understand how variable leaf milk oil is growing in Norwood Lake. Okay. I wanted to also show you this picture because I, I wanted to show folks how, how you can interpret um, graphs, right, in terms of what's happening in the real world. So to the left, right, this red curve here is describing how water milfoil biodensity, so mass, is changing over time, where time is in days. So this is just a simulation. So it's saying that, so this is, milfoil here growing. So this line here is saying that milfoil is growing at roughly a constant rate. So every day, the same amount of milfoil is being added, right? So that line is roughly linear. And that's what happens in this phase here when the plant is under the water. This graph here over to the right shows plant height over time. So I, this is a simulation. I said, ah, let's let the lake be two meters high. So the plant grows higher, higher, higher. When it reaches the surface of the water, it can't grow any higher, right? So it plateaus and it just stays at two meters. The interesting thing here is that at the point of time when the plant reaches the water, this is where it bunches up and it canopies, right? And the biomass starts to get very, very, very dense. You can see to the right, this kink in the curve, right? So it's growing slower, oh, and then it begins to grow faster, right? So that represents that bunching up and that canopy type behavior. Okay. And then at the top, when the curve turns around, that's the end of the season. That's when the plant begins to die back and, and senescence takes over, right? So it's a natural process of plant growth. So I wanted to show you this because this is, this is how mathematicians interpret graphs and then look at real data in order to make comparisons and observations. Okay, so the fun part. Uh, we want to talk about control mechanisms. So we talked about control mechanisms in terms of, so we talked about benthic mats and hand pulling, and those are localized, small scale things, right? There's also large scale things, right? Like herbicides or chemicals that you could do that affect the entire lake. Um, but you could also use biocontrols. And these are also large scale things that affect the entire lake. I call these non-local control mechanisms. So you can just think of them as lake-wide controls. And I would also think of a drawdown as a non-local because it does actually affect most of the lake. And in our case, it, it did affect almost all of the lake. Okay. So I'll talk just a little bit about the work that we've done with um, the local stuff. And then I'm gonna move on to the weevils, which is actually probably uh, my favorite part of the talk. Um, but we should talk about everything. So in order to understand um, how we might model uh, using benthic mats or using hand pulling, uh, we don't just wanna understand how a single plant is growing over time, right? We wanna understand the spatial spread, right? So we wanna understand the spatial distribution. So imagine looking down at the lake from that picture above, you wanna be able to see where the milfoil is throughout the lake. And so this is just a hand sketch I did last night. You can imagine the black boxes or lakes right? and the green blob in the middle is a milfoil patch and you're looking down at it, right? An aerial view. You can imagine at the, maybe the beginning of the season, T equals zero, right? The blob is kind of small. And then maybe three or four months later, the blob gets bigger, right? So the milfoil is spreading outwards, right? It does so through its root systems. Its stalins grow under the ground. 
So the next picture I'm going to show you okay, is a simulation. And so instead of showing you this three dimensional thing that can kind of be a little bit complicated to view, what I'm going to show you is a cross section through that patch. Okay, how the, that cross section changes over time. And I'll, I'll try to take my time here. And if you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask. Right, but you can imagine, right, if you're looking at the cross section, this first picture t equals zero just looks like, uh, right, a small patch maybe that looks like this. And then if you look later, it might look like this. Okay. okay. So to the left, it's kind of a funny, funny initial condition patch. It looks like a square. But what I've started with is just a square of water mill foil in the middle of a lake. And the x-axis here just represents space. So that's the length of the lake, okay? And so the y-axis is the amount of mill foil, okay? And so at the beginning, right, you just have this small square of mill foil. And I put this red line here, and that's the cross section that you're supposed to be visualizing, okay? As time progresses, okay, the patch grows bigger, and it kind of grows out in a circular way, the way that we've defined it. And then again, if I take a slice through it, it looks something like this. It's like a mountain, right? And the peak gets higher, okay? On the bottom, you can see that if I don't do anything at all, at the next time step, the mountain gets a little bit higher. And then what's the last guy? But you can think of the last guy as four or five months, right? The mountain is very high, right? It's spread out a little bit and it, the peak has gotten very high. So it doesn't matter what these units are, but they are grams per meter squared for anyone who wants to know, okay? But the peak is very high. So the idea on top is what things might look like if we do a hand pulling experiment. So here what I've done, so this is T equals 100 days. So at 101 days, I pulled a square out of the center of the patch, right? So if you visualize this line, it just looks like Right, this middle section here is now zero, okay? And then I let the thing run exactly the same as it was running before, just let the simulation go. And if you compare these two time points, drawing a cross section, right, you'll see that the top of the mountains here are under 0 0.7, whereas the bottom's at four. So in this particular case, you can see that hand pulling was successful. And so these are the types of things that our model will be able to predict. However, we need to understand, right, how the milfoil is growing, which we sort of have an idea about, but we need to understand its spreading rate, right, which is something that we also need to gather from experiments. We don't quite know how fast it's radially spreading out. And again, this is, you know, very artificial. It's a circular patch, right? Milfoil is not a circle. So we need to make this, this a little bit more realistic, but I just wanted to give you an idea about what our plan is, what our model can do. And just briefly, um, another idea that we had is to talk about imperfect pulling, because if you're going to be doing pulling, it's very likely that you're going to leave some of the root system underneath, some of the stalins, right? Um, so on the top, you're looking at sort of an aerial vision of what we saw before. So like a circle, say, of milfoil. And this is an example of where I've chopped off the left side of the circle. So it's hand pulling and I've let things run. And in the bottom case, you can see that there's still kind of a shaded area there. So I've left 25% of the roots there and I've let things run. It's hard to see. Okay, but if you look at the total biomass, if I sum up the biomass of all of those squares, it's slightly better in the bottom case, but it's really not that significant. So that was interesting. If you leave 25% of the Stalins with the parameters we used, it really doesn't matter. All that mattered was that we, we tried and we removed, we, we tried to remove half of the bed of milk oil. But again, this is just very preliminary work. Okay. So now let's talk about what I think is the more fun stuff. Oops. So before I talk about the weevils, I'm just gonna talk about um, the benthic mats. We haven't actually, um, we, haven't, we haven't actually gotten a lot of uh, work done with this because again, COVID, uh, the 
the dam was, you know, the water was down and all this stuff. But for those interested, um, we did we did develop our own mats. We uh, figured out the best ways to deploy them. Uh, we figured out a good size so that one or two people can do it, the best material to use. Um, so the partic I forget the exact material that it was made of, but I can ask Michael Twist. And we weighed it down with three quarter inch reverb. Um, we constructed these for 125. And if you try to buy those mats online, it's 500 to 1,000. So anyone with basic seamstress skills um, can easily do this, like in 30 minutes, can make a mat. So um, this is information that we can share if, if individuals are interested in trying benthic mats. We will be doing quantitative studies with benthic mats this summer, um, but then in the future, if anybody wants to try this themselves, and if we are successful, um, we can definitely give you guys uh, the instructions on how to do that yourselves. Okay, so these non-local types of controls, both the weevils and the dry. So the drawdown wasn't actually something that we were going to consider, um, but we ended up considering it because there was a massive drawdown in 2017. Um, it's inexpensive, right? We don't pay for it. It's just something that happens, um, but it does kill invasive and native plants. So there are drawbacks. It reduces fish habitat, power generation, right? Um, and one interesting thing is Brookfield Power can actually just put the water down, but only by point feet without permission. Um, we can actually ask permission, maybe up to three feet, but sometimes that takes a really long time to do. Um, and they require uh, approval of deviation from FERC. So working with all of these people and Brookfield can be a nightmare. Um, so drawdown is not something that we consider as maybe something that's sustainable, but if it happens, all I'm saying is that it's a good opportunity to do some work and I'll show you, I'll show you why. So this is the 12 foot dry down. And some of you may be going, <gasps> right? Summer 2017. So this is Norwood Lake. Uh, this is facing the Southern part of the lake. And this is down here by the North Dam, right? So this is where the water is deeper down in the center. And this is us in a huge patch of milfoil, right? Over in that mud cap region, which I have circled right here. And so the idea was to try to figure out how efficient uh, we could be at removing a large patch of milfoil in the case where there is a major drawdown. So what we did uh, was we pulled the biomass from an 800 meter squared region of the lake and we calculated uh, both time and cost. And then we came back the next season and calculated regrowth back into the area. Um, and this is a technique that we came up with, which was kind of fun. And I'll, I'll just show you this. If, if you have an exposed area of the lake, um, Maybe, the, maybe it's a dry time of the year or the water's lowered a bit. You can use the so-called uh, carpet rolling method and I'll just show you how this works. So as I'm rolling, right, you can easily see the roots and you can dig down and pull up the root as you go. It's like rolling a piece of carpet. And that just continues, right? So you can see why we call it the carpet rolling technique, but all of this is milfoil. So you can see also when it's dried, it looks kind of like uh, bird feathers um, and it's very fragile. So you have to be really careful when you handle it when it's dry. It's even more fragile, right? When it's dry than when it's wet. All right, so in total, um, well, we calculated lots of things but there was 10.12 kilograms of total dry milfoil collected, collected that day. And what we did was we, we put the wet milfoil right on the tarps, we take it back to the lab, we'd remove all the muck and guck and, and then we'd dry it out and we'd calculate it, um, how much we had. And then when we went back the next season, um, we did sort of a back of the envelope calculation in 2018 in that same area, there was roughly only 0.8 uh, kilograms. So the percentage that came back was only about 8%. So we think that, you know, that pull, pull was actually quite a success. We actually went back two summers in a row and we found very similar numbers for regrowth. So that pull was successful. And I think it was so successful 
because when there's water there, it's hard to get the roots, but when there's no water, it's e more easy to see the roots, right? And it's easier to catch the fragments. So I wanted to show you this because I think it's interesting. It's not something that might, it's not gonna be viable, but just, just to know that if you, you are having some sort of drawdown or dry season, this is a great opportunity to do these sorts of things. Okay, time for weevils. Um, so this is really fun stuff that we've, I've, we've recently published some work on this, so I'm excited to hear the results back um, for reviewers on this. Um, so another sustainable management option is, is a biocontrol. And milfoil does have a biocontrol. Um, it has a specialist. So a specialist, it only feeds on milfoil, and it actually prefers invasive varieties over native varieties. So these uh, bugs are called milfoil weevils. So they look like little beetles. You can see the picture here. And what they do is um, the adults will lay their eggs in the mirror stem or the growing end of the plant. And then the larva and the pupae will then feed on the tissue and kind of burrow into the plant. And that halts the growth because nutrients and things can't go from the top to the bottom of the plant um, because that's what needs to happen. The nutrients need to be stored in the ribosome or the root for next season. Sometimes this could kill the plant, maybe pathogens might attack it, um, but oftentimes it just simply reduces the biomass, which is still great, right? Um, one thing about weevils that they do need is that they need to overwinter. So that means that they need to be able to find a home on the shore in leaf litter in order to be able to survive. So they need a so-called buffer zone where there's leaf litter, types of debris, things like that in order to be able to um, overwinter and come back and be successful the year after. So the reason why myself and, and others became interested in uh, this idea of weevils is that natural decline of Eurasian water milfoil is associated in areas where weevils live. Um, so this study I think was done sometime in the 2000s. I forget, I should have put the reference here. Uh, but the green areas are areas where weevils are known to be found. So New York State, yeah, weevils are native there. And then the black dots are places where natural declines of Eurasian water milfoil have also been found. So there's this correlation between natural decline of Eurasian water milfoil and weevils, right? So weevils must be doing something. And after this study was done, um, a number of people, a number of experimentalists got interested in this idea of weevil augmentation. So adding weevils to lakes, which already had weevils to see if they could even do better at reducing Eurasian water milfoil. Um, and a company called EnviroScience got really interested in this and, and started uh, raising tons of weevils and then selling thousands of them to lake communities uh, for tons of money. And um, an individual by the name of Kara Few Brew wrote a thesis on this. Um, so these blocked at block dots or some of the locations within Canada where EnviroScience did some experiments. Basically, they just tossed a bunch of weevils in, calculated Eurasian water milfoil before and after uh, the growing season to see if there was a reduction in the Eurasian water milfoil. So that sort of is what defined it being successful. So out of approximately 60 studies she could find from, from the um, EnviroScience studies, there was basically 50% success, 50% failure. So it was kind of inconclusive whether this augmentation process actually worked. Um, but it did work in some cases, right? It didn't work in some cases and it did work in some cases. And so the question that we had, and I'm sure the question that other people had, they just maybe didn't know how to approach the topic, is why was it successful in some cases? Um, can we determine perhaps lake characteristics or augmentation strategies that were similar between the ones that were successful, right? And maybe those things were different um, in those cases in which it was not successful. So the first thing that we decided to do was a metadata analysis of all of these studies that looked at weevil augmentation. So there were about 133 we could find um, and we're hoping to find more. So about 133 cases, we had these lakes, right? And we had all this information about, you know, phosphorus, nutrients, quality, uh, turbidity, uh, lake depth, lake area, temperature, all of these things. So we amalgamated all of the data that we thought was important for weevil survival. So things like temperature, we know that temperature is important for weevil survival, and, and also things that are important for uh, Eurasian water milfoil growth. Right? So things like temperature, um, 
things like turbidity, how murky the water is. And we came up or we decided on a list of the top eight model predictors that we thought were going to be important to predict weevil success at reducing Eurasian water milfoil. And we actually had a list of 20 of them and I'll explain why we only, I only have eight written down here. But the eight that I have here are latitude. So that's sort of connected to temperature. So we removed temperature because we found that when we were doing our modeling, those were correlated very strongly. So we could remove one of them. Also maximum depth. We also had average depth, but again, those were correlated, giving almost the same results. So we could remove one of those predictors. So maximum depth, lake area, buffer zone refers to the length of the lake shore, which is suitable for weevil overwintering. Okay, so that's really important. Okay, and then chemical predictors, right? So phosphorus and secchi death. And then obviously, right, augmentation strategy should be included in there as well. So treatment frequency, how many times you add weevils to a lake, as well as the number of weevils added, right? 500, 1,000, some studies go over 5,000 weevils. All of these things were different between all of the different lakes, okay? I know one um, individual, and I forget her name, it was a very good question, she asked about panfish. And we had put panfish as a predictor uh, in this model because panfish eat weevils. So we thought, oh, if there's lots of panfish in a lake, that's probably why it wasn't successful. However, unfortunately, the vast majority of those 133 studies did not report whether panfish were in that lake or not. And it was very difficult to find that information. So that's why that information is not in the study. So um, if we go back, right, and, and try to refine this model, that's something I think that's going to be really crucial and important to add, and it might increase the accuracy of our model. Okay, so we have all of these predictors, okay? And so we, we pulled these out of the studies that were already done, and these studies also identify uh, success or not success, right? They already identify that for us. And success was defined in a number of different ways, and, and I won't go into detail about a lot of them, um, but we actually did model all of the different types of success. So we looked at success as being measured in terms of um, stem density, so whether stem density was decreased, whether weight density was decreased, whether percent the percent of EWN changed, uh, something called relative abundance, whether um, native plants were decreased, right, with respect to Eurasian water milfoil. But we didn't have enough data to run our model, right? We think that these types of successes are probably more biologically realistic, but we still need more data points in order to test those measurements of success. So for now, we just went with the lake association and reports definition being that, yes, EWM was decreased. That's success. Failure is if it increased. So now that we have, right, we have this huge data set. We have this data set of these model predictors and these outputs. So what we wanted to do then is to build a predictive model using machine learning. And I'm not going to go into huge detail about this, but machine learning, okay, so you can think about what learning means. The idea is that this machine is trying to learn or try to come up with connections or patterns between these model predictors, so between the lake characteristics and augmentation strategies, and why certain things were successful or not, okay? So this is what the algorithm does. And as an example of what an output might look like in two dimensions, we have eight predictors, don't forget. You cannot visualize eight dimensions. But if you only had two predictors, say, if you're looking here, buffer, so that's weevil habitat, versus average depth, the idea is that you want to try to create a curve, or in this case, it was just a line that separates purple data points from yellow data points. Yellow data points are lakes in which we know, good, it was successful. Purple data points mean it wasn't successful. So we want to try to come up with this curve in order to separate those things. Once we have that curve, right, then if we test a lake in which we don't know weevils would be successful or not, just an arbitrary lake, if the dot 
fell to the right of that line, we would predict that it would be a failure, right? If the lake fell to the left of that line, we would predict that it would be a success. And we, we would probably suggest, yes, go ahead and try using milfoil weevils, okay? So that's the idea. But of course, if you get into all these huge dimensions, you it's called a hyperplane. It's no longer a line. It's this crazy plane thing that you can't visualize. Okay, but we won't talk about that. So the really cool result about this, this paper was that we were able to make the accurate precision, precision. So after doing, you know, creating this predictive model, we tested it. So we tested it on cases which we knew the result, right? So we knew success or failure and we would toss, toss randomly in these cases and 73 to 75% of the time we were accurate, we were right. So that means with approximately 75% accuracy, we can tell you whether um, given certain lake characteristics and a certain augmentation strategy, whether weevils will be a successful, um, a successful route to go for your particular lake. And these models, right, are based on probabilities and statistics, right? So it's not a, simply a yes or no answer. And 75 could be a bit better. And it would be a bit better if we have more data. So that's one plan to make that a little bit better. But these models are really to provide insight to you folks, the stakeholders, right? It, it would be great to have some open source software and you know, and you could have some students easily go out, measure the average depth, measure the phosphorus over the summer, uh, measure the secchi depth. These are all things that an undergrad biology student and even volunteers can do, and then plop it into our, our algorithm and output yes or no. And if it says yes, make sure that you know that's you know only 75% accurate, I'd probably go ahead. If it said failure, right, you might want to Right, you might want to think about that, right? Because even though there is a chance it could work, right, it is expensive, right? So you want to weigh your options, right? Um, the the most interesting, the second most interesting result of this, besides the accuracy of the model, um, was that we did we did feature ranking. So I told you at first we had like twenty features added, and then because of you know data we just couldn't find, we had to remove some stuff or data that was just measured incorrectly, we had to remove some stuff. Um, but then we also did ranking, right? We had maybe 12 or 15 features. And when we were running our model, we found that it was just as accurate with the eight features versus the, you know, the six or seven that we chopped off. They didn't seem to matter. So we removed them. And it turns out that those eight features that I showed you are the most important at predicting weevil success with the top most uh, highly ranked features being, um, which kind of surprised me. Well, one is the depth of the lake, right? So shallow lakes are typically more successful. That makes sense. Um, all, all of the things are, are important, but these are just the, the high, most highly ranked features. And then also the number of augmentations was, was really important. So that surprised me. Um, the, the number of weevils added, I think ranked seven or eight. And, and I thought that the actual absolute value of weevils might rank higher, but it turns out that the number of augmentations, that's more important, adding, adding them more times um, turns out to be more important. So I will leave, leave you with that. Um, I did want just, you know, I talked about panfish earlier. That is definitely something that um, we want to be able to incorporate into our model because we do know after reading a lot of papers that panfish um, are, cr are crucial uh, in the life cycle of the weevils, right? They're natural predators for the weevils. So I will leave you with that. Oh, and actually, I'm not going to leave you with that. I want to leave you guys with some uh, some thoughts about what you could do, right? It, you don't have to be a mathematician to, to do to do anything, right? You could do these small scale pulls, uh, which Jake, right, is going to be doing, which is great. Um, especially when there's a drawdown, just make sure that you have individuals who can show you how to identify the plant and to remove it properly. Um, boat cleaning is important, right? So whether that's hand removal or high pressure wash, a lot of places around here have that now, which is great. Education, right? Signage, um, integrated efforts, which is what we talked about, making sure there's leaf litter for weevils. So that public education, again, right? People here love their, you know, nice clean lawns, like right down to the river, but just make a little barrier at the at the end in case you know weevils want to overwinter. 
um, and then work with local lake associations about fish restocking. So the NLA has decided not to restock with panfish, which is great. So if you can talk to your local you know, lake communities and just ask them not to put panfish in, that's, I mean, maybe there's no weevils, maybe weevils won't work, but there's no harm in it, right? They're just, it's just a good idea. Um, and I will leave you at that. I can put up my contact info here in case anybody wants to get a hold of me, but you can always look just Diana White Clarkson, you can find me. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty easily searchable. And I have a website here with some of the, some of the stuff we talked about today. So I can stop screen sharing. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Sorry, that was a lot. I talked a lot. <laughs> that was great, thank you. Um, I have a few questions that people sent in um, ahead of time. So uh, while people are thinking of their questions or typing them in the chat box, um, I think I'm just going to head towards, uh, we had quite a few questions about doing the small scale polls. So I don't know if you want to talk uh, just a little bit more about um, like best methods for that or your experience doing that in Norwood. Yeah, so with uh, the folks in Norwood, um, we we only the only major pull that we did was during the drawdown. Um, I had done some of my own pulling on my property myself, um, myself and my husband, um, and some folks in Colton um, have actually some really good ideas as well. So uh, in Higley Flow, they did some uh, milfoil pulls. So they had somebody pulling in the muck, so they probably went out to their knees. Um, somebody was around with like a catch net, which would catch all of the fragments that were floating out. Um, so that's one thing that they did. There's also these nice uh, bags, and I can give you guys information on that. Netted bags, you can make your own. It's just a net, right, that you can put the milfoil in as you go. So you don't have to get out of the water every single time you pick a handful. Um, and then also a lot of folks say that lying on a boogie board is actually really easy for like, uh, if you're really sh like shallow because you're not standing and disturbing the muck and you can kind of just reach down. So if it's really shallow, if you lie on a board, um, you can pull it up and then you can pull it onto your board. Um, so yeah, unfortunately though, with the hand pulling, right, you can only get out, you know, to your knees or maybe even your thighs if you wanna, you know, go under with your goggles, um, but you can't get out super deep unless you know you're you're a good swimmer so having maybe a couple of folks who who are fairly good at swimming who can dive down as well to get out to the deeper parts is, is a good idea thanks diana um does anyone want to unmute themselves and ask a question you can raise your hand if you want to and i can call on you if that's more comfortable Kevin has a question. Uh, Shauna has a question. Yeah. Sam has a question. In that order. Let's see. I'll unmute you, Shauna. There we go. Oh, Kevin? I have two questions. You said lake depth was uh, a number that you needed in your model. Yep. He, he has a, an average depth number that they supply with their contour maps of the lakes. Is yep. that the number you want to enter or the maximum depth number? So with our model, um, we, we, we did include average depth, which includes like the, 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 all those measurements from the contour map. But we found that it, it did correlate, meaning that it ranked almost the same as the average lake depth, uh, the maximum lake depth. So we pulled that from our model and it, so it was just max depth. Um, okay. That could change. Like, so... If you can get all this information, I would. So, so we're doing this for Norwood Lake, but we're going to toss both average and and max depth into the model. There's no harm in adding more predictors. Um, okay. So you can do both of those. We just found that it seemed like it it was almost the same as max depth, and max depth is easier to calculate than obviously the whole lake. We go out just if you wanted to get that. We actually just went out with a. We made like a nice uh, grid and we went out with the depth finder. We had some community members just go out with their fishing boats. Sure. Yep. Yeah. I have one more question. Yep. 
we have teachers at school that I think that would cooperate with an effort in raising these beetles if it was a, a feasible thing for a, for a school biology class or a limnology class to do. Is that is that worth exploring or not? Um, I think Wiley talked about this, and this is something that Jake's looking into as well. Um, there's an individual who created a manual for 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 doing this, like in a similar in a similar way, like at a high school or or in um in in a similar type of environment. We actually had a small grant to do exactly this. There's there's a number of papers that give exact directions on how to raise these sorts of things in, in control tanks. And yes, it's definitely something high school students, undergrads can do. Um, Jake, you might even want to talk about what your plan is. Yeah, yeah. so the IRLC this summer, we're going to start a pilot program um, to see the feasibility of raising weevils. Um, and then that's something that we can go out and teach to the various lake associations so they can raise their own. Um, the one drawback that we see right now is a source for weevils. Um, I don't know if Diana has a, a different source, but EnviroScience um, was the only supplier and they no longer supply weevils. Um, so you have to catch your own starter stock. Um, I am the, the woman who gave me the manual, she is from uh, Wisconsin. Um, and she, in the future plans on selling a starter stock for uh, lake associations to start their own weevil rearing program, um, but she is not at that level yet. Um, but we are gonna try this summer and catch our own and see the, the feasibility of doing that. And then um, we will be presenting that to our lake associations. Good. Yeah, so that was the major issue we had as well. It was a three month project, but we didn't know where the weevils were, right? So the, th the ideas are very small and the way that you can find the weevil is knowing what the damage to the plant looks like. So the damage to the plant is really easy to see, but the weevils themselves are very small. So you have to understand what a damaged uh, milfoil plant looks like before you can go ahead and then find the weevils. But still, I think that a limnology class um, or something like that, just having somebody out and doing this for the summer could, that if that was their job, right, they could figure that out. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's raising the weevils is, is fairly easy. Um, it's a very easy process. Just getting them is, uh, is the hard part. Um, so. Good, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I think we had Shauna who had a question. Yeah, um, good job, Diana. Um, I had a, I'm her twin sister, if you guys are wondering, we look identical. <laughs> um, I had a question about, so it was earlier on in your talk and you just showed a picture of the Norwood Lake um, along the, the Racket River system and the places where there were denser populations and more sparse populations of the milfoil. And I wondered if you guys considered um, just along a river system in general, those positions actually all look like they're populated on the outer arc or the cut bank of a river system. And is this something that has been looked at um, where like these are regions of like, I guess along a stream or a river system, that outer arc generally has um, different velocity flows of the stream. Um, and is that something that is affecting why milfoil is most likely to populate the, that cut bank or outer arc of the river? Yeah, right. So, so one thing we do know is that it, it likes sedentary areas, right? In order for it to, to, to um, populate, right, it can't be in fast moving water. Which is interesting because like usually the cut bank area- Oh, the cut bank is fast is usually fast. Right. So, so one of the issues, so that's a good question. So those two areas that I showed you on the bank are areas in which people have properties and very large docks. So one thing that also is happening is that the milfoil is getting caught up in the docks and then it, it, you will notice that that is also a pattern. People have big docks, milfoil is getting caught up in the docks and then it's growing around the dock region. So in a naturally, a naturally occurring system, they might not Probably actually wouldn't. populate in that region. Okay. Probably not. Probably okay. not. Interesting. Sam. Uh, thanks for your question. Um, yeah, Sam. That happened to my doc. I'm sorry, Drew. <laughs> 
Uh, I actually can't hear Sam. I can't hear you, Sam. You're connecting. There, we might have you now, Sam. Try again. Oh, we still can't hear you, Sam. Sam, if you type your question in the chat box, I'll read it out loud for you. Oh, um, is, is Sam is Sam also on a phone? Because the phone is, if, if you were on the phone, if you were the person on the phone, the phone is muted. Um, um, I'm not sure, because. Yeah. Let's give him a second. Sam, I think your phone might be <laughs> muted. I'm I'm going to move on and we'll come back if we can. Um, all right. Anybody else have a question? Uh, Gina Matt, raised yeah, her hand. Okay. And Gina oh, raised her hand there. Sorry. Too, <laughs> it's fine. We'll do, we'll do her after. You want me to go first? Sure. All right. Um, my question is related to Shauna's. And uh, she was asking about what characteristics are in these high density areas within uh, Norwood Lake. I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about the buffer zone at Norwood Lake, particular to that area that, we're, that you see this heavy infestation. You know, what is the land use? You know, is it, uh, you know, um, a lot of camps or not so many camps? Um, you know, things of Yes, I'm just going to pull up a picture here. So it looks like, um, so the one that's down at the southern part of the lake, there are no camps. It's completely, it's a completely a perfect buffer zone for weevils. Uh, the one that is the, the, the large problem in the mud cap, um, it's not, there's not a lot of houses, but there's also not a lot of buffer. If you, if you go around it, the road actually comes very, very close to the lake. Um, and there's a lot of rocks. It's a very rocky area. So I would probably say half of it is buffer and half of it is not. And there's some camps. Here, I'll just show you a screen. I'm just going to show you exactly what I mean. I'll pull that map up again. Right, so here. So this is, this is the region here. Um, and so there's a lot of, there's some camps and houses right here, right? And this is actually where the problem is the worst. Um, and there is some, there is kind of half buffer zone, half not a lot of these camps do take care of the property. This right here is more like natural buffer, I would say. And then this right here, um, there's no camps, but uh, it's pretty rocky and the road is very close to, to here. And so this wouldn't be considered a buffer, but weevils could, could still be effective. Like there is still some natural buffer right here. And again, our model would probably, our model would be able to predict if we'd have to input buffer length into the model and then that would be uh, an input for the model and it would predict yes or no. Can I make one comment? Yep. And this is more just aimed at the group and as it relates to uh, invasive species control, in many cases from a biocontrol, we're using uh, a, a, a species that is not native to our area in order to control the invasive species itself, right? Um, purple loosestrife and a few others fall into that category. Um, but this particular weevil that we're talking about is actually native. So mm -hmm. it's actually a, a very good you know, solution um, that warrants further study. And I'm glad to see some of the information that came out of this um, presentation today because we're looking at it. And uh, while there is no silver bullet, it's certainly a good opportunity to uh, learn more about controlling milfoil, if you will. And the reason I asked that question, um, I know that uh, a lot of property owners along lakes, we, we tend to, as humans, wanna have a neat shoreline so we've adopted certain practices such as raking up leaves and picking up sticks and, and burning them, if you will. But the reality is, is that that is the habitat that weevils use to overwinter. So um, being that we all live in the North Country, um, if we reduce that habitat along the shoreline, 
we're actually uh, reducing the ability of the weevil to make it through the winter. That, that, that's a really great point. Um, so we do a little, uh, some community outreach as well. And when we, that, that last slide that I showed you, the stewardship is, is, is just what can you do? Like what can we do right now without math, without anything, just knowing, you know, naturally how EWM grows and how, what, what weevils need to be successful at least, at the very least. Thank you. We can try Sam. Let's try Sam one more time. Sam, can we hear you? I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes, yes hear we me. can. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Well, I already typed it on the uh, comments thing, but what I was going to add was this. On Bonaparte, we've used weevils for about 12, 13 years or so. We used to have a terrible problem in our shallow bays. Our shallow bays now look very good. Um, we have educated the public about bluegills, sunfish, um, and when we run the kids' fishing derby in July, I started the tradition of bringing a big old cooler, and any bluegills that a fisherman doesn't want go into that cooler, and that and those all become compost up in my father, my father-in-law's compost heap. <laughs> so, you know, really, you know, I, I can, here at Bonaparte, we can testify, weevils work really come a long way all right that's awesome um i actually bonaparte is one of the lakes in in my study that you guys had some really really nice reporting of your of your uh work so maybe i'll actually contact you to make sure i had all of it because i'd be interested to yes thank you because i i'd like to meet i'd like to speak with dr twig too because i know he comes over here with a, um, or somebody comes over here with a helicopter periodically to get water samples. Oh gosh, I don't know. Clarkson does everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, definitely kind of not funny. Michael Twist people, coming over people, in a helicopter. People think it's some celebrity. I'm like, no, no, no. They're testing the water. <laughs> That's a good question. How, how, how uh, wide does the buffer or leaves need to be? Um, and I actually have an exact answer for this. Uh, um, if somebody else wants to ask a question, I'm going to just look for that exact number now on my computer because I do have an exact number for you. So yeah, feel someone can feel free to ask another question. Just raise your Hi. hand or unmute yourself and go ahead. Hi, this is Jenny Bush. and. Um, I just wondered if you have a nice, like, sort of uh, a handout that you could give to people, like for guidelines for how to do hand pulling, uh, the information on leaving buffer zones. And are those buffer zones just things you have to leave for the overwintering, like people who really want to keep it clean during the summer when they're using their shore for swimming and stuff, and then just encourage them to let the buffer zone build up with leaves and twigs. And so just kind of like guidelines type of thing that we could share, like Lake Bonaparte, I know that's the lake I'm at all the time. So I'm glad to hear the weevils were very successful. Um, but, you know, to post like, so people can have, have some things that they can actually do or volunteers could go out and do. Um, I hope that makes sense. So to answer your question, so first I found the, the buffer zone. So adequate buffers for overwintering are three to five meters in breadth. Um, so that means going back, um, it needs to be three to five meters going back uh, towards your towards your property. And the other answer to your question is that no, right now we don't have any sort of pamphlet or something like that. That would be great. I mean, we could probably work in consultation with, with other individuals. Um, in order to make that happen. Um, but yeah, we don't, we don't have a pamphlet or anything like that right now. I would suggest though, so because you, we don't know exactly when weevils start to overwinter, I mean, there, there are studies that, you know, probably give the like average month when they start to go ashore, but I'm sure that every year is slightly different. Um, so there's probably, you know, an upper bound and a lower bound to that. Um, but yeah, that's probably reasonable to, to have if you really want to clean it for a certain period of time. But 
having a three to five meter buffer zone doesn't see it doesn't seem like that would be sustainable, right? You probably want to just keep that there all year round. That's pretty big. Uh, Jake, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say I've uh, I've read and heard from uh, a couple different researchers that a good rule of thumb is um, to not to leave that buffer zone from Labor Day till Memorial Day, um, okay. and then you can clean it up in the summertime. So don't don't mow that part and don't rake it for just from Labor Day to Memorial Day. Um, no. Can I can I make a comment? Yep. Anybody hear me? Um, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, regarding buffer zones, um, the, uh, my name's Rick Lopez and I'm with the uh, IRLC. The, the book I was using to, to educate people on buffer zones is called Lakescaping for Wildlife and Water Quality. And it's a, a production of the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. And uh, it's, it's a really good book that uh, lays out um, the hows and whys and, and uh, instructional and, and so on and so forth. So I'll, I'll say it again, it's lakescaping for wildlife and water quality. And I got mine through Amazon. Would you mind typing the, uh, you could type it in the chat? And... I, I'm on my phone and I don't know uh, where okay. that is. Um, but, um, I'm going to send out an email after this, so I'll send it in the email to everybody. And maybe we can get a couple copies for the office, too, so that um, people you know, can come I, in and look at them. Yeah, I, I bought a number of copies. I thought maybe I dropped one off with you, but maybe I didn't. So if you don't find it, I'll bring one down and give it to you. Great. And I, I also have a reference I can add there. Um, name is, I don't know if you guys have heard th Thor's. Thorstenson, he has a he has a good reference on just weevil buffers in general, so I can I can try to find that hard copy and send that to you. Um, I think we have a question from Steve Swallow. Steve, are you there? I I think she already covered it. Oh, there you are. I, I think she okay. already covered it. So, so some, someone Anybody else, else uh, I, I did put Anybody in, else yeah, jump uh, in? A, um, a, a connection for a publication from Michigan State about um, <coughs> management. Great, thank you, Steve. Heidi, can I jump in? Sure, go ahead. I just wanted to make a couple of comments. They're not questions, just that um, with a chemical application, it depends on what chemical you use, whether you are just focusing on milfoil um, which just kills the milfoil and leaves the native weeds um, as, as they are. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to comment on was that weeds grow very nicely on top of those mats. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. So, so this is actually, so there's one, there's only one study that has actually, um, so it's an experimental study. It's only one study. Uh, they looked at the appropriate length of time for which to lay a mat in order to see uh, milfoil reduction. So they, so they, for example, lay down one mat for a month, one mat for two months, one mat for three months, and they notice exactly what you're talking about. After you know one month, sediments start to build up, and then the plants start to grow on top of the mat. And so, with our particular model, that is one of the most important things that we have to take into consideration. There's going to be a sweet spot. So there's going to be you know a time period in which, sure, you leave. The mat there, what's underneath is denuded, but then the plants are just growing on top of the mat. So yes, you're right. After different lakes are, are certain lakes are different, but there there will be a sweet spot in which you have to remove the mat because you're going to end up getting the sediment buildup and the plant growth on top of the mat. So maybe we'll take one more question. Thank you, Jan. Good to see you. Anybody there's a, else? There's a question in the chat from Patricia and Christopher Hodlin at 123. Okay. Uh, so the question is, what is the average root depth? Is there a depth where milfoil can't grow and um, Recognizing that breaking off a plant may cause more plants um, 
but is it worse than doing nothing? So is risking the fragmentation um, better than not managing? So is there a depth where milfoil can't grow? So um, again, this all depends on the turbidity, the murkiness of the water. It can be viable up to 33 feet. Like I suggested past that in perfectly clear water, it has not been found to grow. So that's the maximum depth to which it can grow. Typically it only grows, and I think I even had this here in regular, I mean, this is just sort of like an average, um, anywhere from three to 13. So in most lakes, almost all lakes, you would not see it growing uh, deeper than 13 feet. But if it was very clear for some reason, it could grow up to 33 feet. Um, and what is the average root depth? Um, that's a good question. I don't know how far the roots grow down, but from my own experience, um, downwards, the roots don't grow downward uh, very far. The longest roots that I've seen were maybe four or five inches. Um, the issue is the roots that grow outwards, right? So they grow, most of the roots are growing in the horizontal direction and those can grow, right, very far. They, they grow, create a new plant, and those grow and create a new plant. But the ones that grow downwards, when you need to reach down in the muck, I would say that you probably only have to maybe reach down just to be safe, maybe half a foot, I would say, six inches. Um, and then your last question, recognizing that breaking off a plant may cause more, more plants, um, but is it worse than doing nothing? Um, Again, there's not enough quantitative hand pulling studies to suggest this, but I would say that localized hand pulling, if you have some folks that know what they're doing, yes, it is better than, than doing nothing. I do not suggest that somebody who doesn't know what they're doing to go out um, and just do it themselves, because I do think that, that they would just spread fragments, they wouldn't get all the roots and they would make things worse. So if you at least have one or two people to show you the proper, root pulling strategy and also somebody monitoring the fragments if a few are let go, that's that's okay. Um, so I think it's better to do localized pulling than nothing, but have people on hand who are going to help you catch fragments and help to teach you how to properly pull the roots. So these are, yeah, these are good questions. Um, one quick follow-up question that had come in earlier is um, the effect on the oxygen in the water from uh, milfoil. And then after that, Diana, if you wanna give us a closing thought and then I'll let Wiley do the final closing thought. Thank you. Sure. So the question about oxygen, um, I, I, I wasn't exactly sure what was meant, but I think what they're talking about, so they were trying to compare algae, right? And Eurasian water milfoil. And right, the issue with algae blooms, right, is eutrophication, which means dumping a lot of nutrients into a lake. And, and algae, right, love to grow in these nutrient dense, dense types of environments. Lots of algae grow very, very quickly. And then what happens as they're decaying, they, they, uh, they, they need oxygen. So they eat up the oxygen in the water. And of course, all, all plants do that. Um, but milfoil doesn't really grow in the same way. It kind of grows the same in you. Uh, what's the word, eutropic, nutrient rich, right? And not with much nutrients, right? So, and it doesn't have that quality where it's decaying very quickly like algae and, and eating up all the oxygen. I would assume if a lake was completely infested with EWM, right? And there was a lot of plant senesce or a lot of plant dieback, right? That would be eating up the oxygen and you might have some issues there and it completely right, invaded lake. But in general, um, I don't think that, that that is the same as, you know, you don't have the same issue with EWM as you do with the algae blooms with regards to like these no oxygen or um, dead zones. But I'm not an expert on uh, algae blooms and such. So, but that's just my thought about it. Okay. Uh, did you want to give us a final thought? And thank you. I just want to say thank you. For yeah, this was really fun. You guys asked really good questions. You're better than my students. No, I'm just kidding. Um, well, some of the questions were excellent. Um, so my final thoughts. Um, well, I think that this is an ongoing effort. I think that um, it's very exciting that people are 
doing quantitative things. I know that math sounds scary to people, but collecting data and then analyzing the data to understand how things work is really important, right? And understanding how these, how these control mechanisms can, can work in a quantitative way is the way that we're gonna figure out how to do things, right, properly. Um, we're not gonna be able to determine exactly how to do things, but we can, we can provide insight into how to do things. And um, we're gonna continue our work on understanding um, these different types of control mechanisms, and it would be fun to get other, other people on board. But my thoughts are just, um, you know, sharing, sharing what you know with other people is important because some people just have absolutely no idea about this. And with those few simple practices that I've stated right at the end, it's almost like stopping coronavirus, right? Just tell people to wear a mask and to social distance, right? And it can help a lot. It's the same thing with weevils, right? Just tell people to keep some leaf litter there and, you know, um, and do these, these simple other things like talking about boat cleaning. It will help a lot, right? Um, there's no harm in doing it. So I guess that's my closing thought. Um, this was a lot of fun and maybe one day when we have some more significant results, we can come back and I hope to talk to you guys about your weevil raising stuff because that would be really fun to actually try to do some modeling with that as well. Thank you, Diana. Wiley, did you want to close? Yeah, thank you, Diana. This talk was very timely. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we just brought Jacob Ball on board thanks to New York State DE or a co combined partnership program with the Land Trust Alliance. We got a one year grant. And his second day on the job, he found this group out in Minnesota that had had some success in raising weevils. And uh, you were already, this was just last week, and you were already in the docket to, to talk. So this was just really, really great timing. So thank you. It was really great to see everybody. I encourage everybody to go have a hot bowl of soup and I look yep. forward to next winter when we can all enjoy it together. I know there's Jan Douglas in the middle blowing kisses to us. Uh, she makes a, <laughs> a wonderful bowl of soup. She normally brings up to the library a couple times during the winter, but uh, yep. we're excited for, for this spring and this summer. Uh, we're, we're, we're gonna have a much better year and see more of you I know than we did last year. And hopefully in a year from now, things will be very much back to the old world the way we used to know it. So thanks, it was really great to see everybody. Take care and have a great uh, winter. We'll see you at the next talk. Thanks everybody. Thanks so much, thank bye. You, bye. Bye. bye.